Good morning, church family, and those of you who are watching across the internet, we're glad that you could join us for today's message, which is entitled, A Father's Discipline. A Father's Discipline. And our main text is in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. Hebrews 12, verses 7 through 9. And so I want to wish all the fathers out there a very happy Father's Day. And I pray that you will have a good Father's Day. And I just want to appreciate you uh, for the love and the discipline and the instruction that you bring your child up in. And so uh, I hope that this message uh, will be inspiring to you. I hope it will be encouraging to you. And it will also make you feel appreciated as a father. Well, I heard of a young boy who went to an extremely expensive university. And the bills were coming in monthly to his parents, and they were just struggling to keep their heads above water. Well, one day, the, the mother received a text message from her son that read, Dear Mom, I'm writing to inform you that I have flunked all of my courses. I had an accident and totally wrecked my car, and I owe the clothing store in town $2,000. And I have been suspended for the next semester due to misconduct. I'm coming home. Prepare dad. His mother typed a one-line text in response that just read this way. Dear son, dad is prepared. Prepare yourself. Have you ever been there? Uh, perhaps you have had a time in your life when you have done something wrong and your mom said to you, just wait until your father gets home. Yeah, I've heard that one many times. But discipline is a very important and necessary system in the life of a child. Uh, God expects fathers to discipline their children. And it is this process that exposes a father's heart to see his children develop great character traits. Now, I have to say that there are many children, especially today, that don't have a father in their life at all or who don't have a father who disciplines them. And when a father does not invest the time and energy and make the sacrifices that are necessary for disciplining his child, then there is no father-child relationship. Now, in order to help his readers understand God's discipline in the life of a believer, the writer of Hebrews reminds them of their earthly fathers who used discipline as they raised them in their childhood. He tells them that a father has an important place in raising children. Now let me ask you, who loves his child more? The father who allows his child to do what will harm him? Or the father who will correct and train and even punish the child to help him learn what is right? Well, the writer acknowledges that it is never pleasant to be corrected or disciplined by God. But his discipline is a sign of his love for us. And so when God corrects you, see it as the evidence of his love for you and ask him what he is trying to teach you. Now, in biblical times, a father who neglected to discipline his sons was considered not worthy of being a father. And so it's logical that God should discipline his children that he loves. Well, God wants us to finish our lives well. Therefore, he chastens us. Now, this chastening is a blend of discipline and nurture. And when we experience it, we should embrace it because it's a sign that God loves us. Well, you see, only the most uncaring, dysfunctional father would ignore teaching and correcting his child. 
And we have a Father who loves us much more than any earthly father could ever love us. So before we get into God's Word, let's go to Him in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You for this day that we celebrate and we honor our fathers. Lord, we thank You for these men who have been influential in our lives as we've grown up. We thank You for their willingness to take the time and the energy and to make the sacrifices that are necessary for us to be disciplined in order that we might learn to do right. Father, I pray that you would be with the fathers who are raising children. Father, I pray that you would give them the wisdom and the knowledge that they need, that you would give them the patience and the love that they need to raise their children. Father, help them not to neglect discipline. And Father, I pray that that you would be with me this morning, that as I speak your word, that you would give me the words that you'd have me to speak, that your spirit would move me and guide the words that I speak. Help me to communicate clearly this word that fathers need to hear so badly. Father, help us all to be able to raise our children, the next generation and our grandchildren, to pursue righteousness, to pursue a relationship with you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, may everything that we do point our children and grandchildren to Jesus. And Father, may they have a love for you and a love for others. Father, we ask that you would be pleased and glorified through everything that is said and done here this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verses 7 through 9. Hebrews 12, 7 through 9. And the writer says, Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children, not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? we find out that God uses hardships for our good. Now, none of us like hardships. We don't like going through and experiencing hard, difficult times. But God uses those difficulties. He uses those hardships to help us to become better. Now, chastening, which is another word for discipline, means instructing training, discipline, and correction. And we may respond to discipline or chastening uh, in several different ways. We can accept it with patience. Uh, We don't like it, but we endure it. We can accept it with self-pity, thinking that we really don't deserve it. We can become angry and resentful toward God. Or we can accept it gratefully as the appropriate response that we owe to a loving Father, where we realize that it is for our own good. Now, the home must have structure, an environment that would cause their children to want to accept Jesus Christ and a loving, nurturing atmosphere that disciples their children to love God with all their heart and to love others as they love themselves. Now, when a child is rebellious to the structures that parents set up, guidelines for correction should be applied from the Word of God. And when these guidelines are upheld, They should be consistent for every one of their children. Now, we have to realize that 
children are individual. Uh, they're all different. And so what works with one child may not work for another. It may not be appropriate for one, but it is for another. And so we have to keep that in mind as we're disciplining. But the idea is that you don't discipline one child, but not another child. You just have to find the form of discipline that works for each child. And so this is how, like we said, a father demonstrates his love, his sincere love for his children. And he creates respect in the life of the child. Now, we may not respect it when we're going through the discipline. But as we get older and we mature and we look back, we can respect them for that. And so the respect that is generated leads the child to develop a character that pleases God and blesses his parents. And so we need to see and understand that discipline is necessary. It is necessary. And I know that there may be a lot of people that will ask this question today, and that is, is discipline necessary? And the answer is yes, it is necessary. You see, I have witnessed how well-mannered children are who have been disciplined from an early aged. In contrast to those children who have never been disciplined and have a rebellious attitude. It's very important to discipline our children. You see, a parent will never be filled with regret over disciplining a child when they grow older. But one who has never disciplined his child will always regret not doing it. Now, too often, children are seen as liabilities rather than assets. However, God says that children, our children, are a gift from Him. In Psalm 127, verse 3, Psalm 127, verse 3, He says, sons are a inheritance, in other words, a gift or an inheritance from the Lord children a reward from him. Now I know that some people have a problem with the concept of sonship in the Bible. But the word son in the Bible is used in several different ways. But it always refers to a relationship or affiliation. Now granted, most of the time in the Bible it refers to a male child, a son. But it is also used to indicate a direct uh, descendant, like a child or a grandchild. But it's also used metaphorically to reflect a characteristic, a profession, a citizenship, or religion. And so biblically, a son, to be a son, means to follow in someone's footsteps, to imitate another's actions or to an extent, fulfill the Father's life and purpose. Now, to be a son in Israel in Jesus' day was to be an extension and a representative of the parents, particularly the Father. And so the guidance that is given to parents regarding sons is also universal for daughters. So it applies just as well to daughters as it does to the sons. Now, while our children are gifts from God, the Bible instructs us that they are born into a world of sin and are shaped by sin. David, after acknowledging his sin with Bathsheba, said in Psalm 51, verse 5, Psalm 51, verse 5, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. What David is saying here is that because of the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden, this world is polluted with sin. And each one of us is born into it with a natural tendency or inclination 
to sin. And so as a result, we are born with an inward desire to please ourselves. And when we follow that desire, we end up sinning and displeasing God, thus driving a wedge, a spiritual wedge between us and God. And so discipline, both physical and spiritual, helps us to do what is right, even when we are tempted to sin. David's son Solomon wrote in Proverbs 22, verses 6 and 15, Proverbs 22, 6 and 15, he says, train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. Then verse 15, folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far away. And so we see through this text that we have to train our children to make right choices as they grow up and mature. And so we have to recognize the individual strengths and weaknesses of our children and help them to pursue right paths. Now, because folly or foolishness is bound up in their hearts, discipline is necessary to drive away that foolishness. Now, young children, and sometimes even us adults, often do foolish and dangerous things simply because we don't understand the consequences of our actions. And yes, there is consequences to our actions. There are positive consequences, positive results, and there are negative consequences, negative results of our actions. And we need to understand that, and we need to teach our children to understand that. Well, a child has to be taught wisdom. Uh, this is different than knowledge. Knowledge is an accumulation of information. And I believe that this generation, more than any other generations before, is the most knowledgeable. We have the internet today and social media, and so information can be accessed in just a few seconds. Now, the problem is, is that a lot of that information is wrong or misleading information. So it's not always accurate, it's not always correct. And so a child has to have the wisdom to be able to discern the knowledge that he or she has, to discern whether this is right and correct and good, or whether it's wrong, evil, and misleading. And so the child has to be taught wisdom. And wisdom is just the ability to take information and put it into application, to, to put it into practice, to use it correctly. And so training and discipline cannot be ignored in the life of a child. And just as God trains and corrects us when we sin to make us better, we as parents, and especially us as fathers, must discipline our children to make them learn the difference between right and wrong. So yes, discipline is necessary. But let's look at the purpose of discipline. Why discipline? Now that we've established that discipline is necessary, what is the purpose of discipline? Well, as I've already said, discipline shows not only a father's love for his child, but it exposes God's love for us as well. And so when a parent disciplines a child based on a correct interpretation of the Word of God, they are demonstrating a love for God and for the child. And we need to understand, whether we're adults or we're children, we need to understand that discipline is for our own good. It helps to develop our character. And as we've already seen in our main text, discipline at times is not easy. 
And most of the times, it is very painful. But if we face our trials and we endure them, we build up our endurance, which helps us to be committed to our walk with the Lord despite the pressure that comes from trials. In James, in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, James 1, 2 through 4 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Well, as parents, we do our children a great disservice if we continually save them from going through difficult times. Now, I understand we don't ever want as parents to see our children in pain and suffering and going through difficult situations. We, we try to protect them. We try to save them. We try to ease the pain. But we do a great disservice when we don't allow them to go through some difficulties and some trials in their own life. There are times when we do have to protect them and, and keep them safe from those things. But there's a lot of times that we need to take the hands off and let them experience that difficult time. As a parent, we should teach them how to make it through those difficulties. Because when they grow up and they leave the house, or God forbid that something would happen to us as their parents, and we pass, how are they ever going to be able to face the difficulties and the trials in their life if we have always been the ones to protect them and keep them safe and not allow them to experience those things in their life. So we have to teach them how to get through difficult times. Well, Solomon wrote in Proverbs 19, verse 18, Proverbs 19, verse 18, he says, discipline your son, for in that there is hope. Do not be a willing party to his death. Well, that's not a really good encouraging verse, is it? Uh, but the King James Version says, Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. So it sounds a little bit different, but it's basically the same thing. What Solomon is saying is that we need to discipline our children before their habits are formed and they are sealed for life. Now it's been said that by the time a child reaches the age of five, they have already developed their personality. They've already developed and formed their, uh, their habits. And it's not to say that, that those habits, if they're bad, can't be unlearned and relearned with new habits. But it's a lot harder after that five-year age. And so the longer we wait to discipline our children, the harder it is to correct wrong habits and, and wrong behaviors. And so we need to discipline before those habits set in and they take root. Now, Solomon is not promoting cruel punishment, okay? Rather, he's telling us that cruel kindness, and that's what it is when we neglect to discipline them and correct them, it's cruel kindness, it actually destroys the child in ruin and death. And so it's better that they cry now from strict but appropriate discipline or punishment than for you to cry later at their ruin. And so discipline provides instruction that is focused on inspiring faith. When you discipline your child, it should inspire faith in them. Now, my father was one who was quick to use a belt, and probably some of you may have had a father just like that. And there was no instruction other than bend over, right? You probably 
have been there as well. But my dad was not a religious man as I was growing up. And so he didn't understand the need for godly instruction to instill faith. No, all he knew was what he had learned from his father, and that was to instill fear. Well, Paul encourages Timothy as his son in the faith in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. He says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. In other words, from his grandmother and his mother. And how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And so Timothy had a grandmother and a mother who were believers and who taught him the scriptures at home first, and then they continued his instruction through the church, and most specifically, the Apostle Paul. And so it's necessary for parents and grandparents to instill biblical teaching in their child's life first at home, rather than just leaving it up to the church. Now, over the 25 years I've been a minister, I have seen many parents, and sometimes grandparents, but mostly parents, who drop their kids off for Sunday school, or for worship service, or youth group, or for VBS. But yet they don't stay for themselves, or they don't have any kind of biblical instruction in the home. They leave that all up to the church. But going back even into the Old Testament, God has always commanded the parents and even grandparents to instruct their children at home. When you get up in the morning, when you're sitting down to eat, when you're going about your day and you're going out on walks and and trips, and then when you're getting ready to lay down to go to bed at night, you have opportunities to teach your children about God and His Word. And so that is the primary instruction of God's word is to be from your parents and to be from your grandparents into your home. And then the church can help supplement that teaching. But so many families are not teaching their children the word of God and introducing their children to Jesus in the, in the home. And that's where it's got to start. And I'm so thankful that my mom was a Christian and that she had instructed me with biblical wisdom and discipline that instilled within my heart not only a faith in Jesus, but a love for Jesus. Well, discipline structures a child's life by seeking to lead them to Christ. And the Holy Spirit is the best teacher who addresses the sin and wickedness in their lives. And so discipline teaches them to love the Word of God through modeling of the Word by their parents and giving the Word practical significance, which builds wisdom and it removes foolishness. Now I remember that whenever I would say to my mom, why do I have to do this? Uh, She would open up the Bible and she would show me where it is pleasing to God to obey him and my parents. And she would take me to other passages of scripture and, and, and explain things to me. But she would explain that we are doing this or you are doing this to bring honor to me, mom, uh, but mostly to bring honor to God. So you are doing this to honor and please God. And so discipline creates structure within the family. Uh, There's a time to eat and a time to sleep. There's a time to study for school. There's a time to go to church, a time to play, and a time to do chores. So there's structure in the home. 
And structure teaches a child to manage their emotions and their impulses as well as to be responsible. And I have to say that there are many children, many kids today who are not taking responsibility. Not taking responsibility for their own actions, but also not taking responsibility for helping out in the home. Well, notice that I haven't talked much about spanking or paddling. And that's because that is not the first automatic, automatic thing that you go to in godly discipline. It is only when the child doesn't respect the discipline structure that the rod of correction shapes their character. Now, for years, you and I have probably heard people preach, spare the rod, spoil the child. Now, the principle and the concept is biblical, but the exact phrase is not found in the Bible. It actually comes from a poem from the 17th century. But the main scripture that it's kind of based off of and, and kind of um, you can find the principle to is in Proverbs, the 13th chapter, verse 24. Proverbs 13, verse 24, where it says, He who spares the rod, now notice that it doesn't say spoils the child, it says hates his son. But he who loves him is careful to discipline him. And so the principle is there. We are actually spoiling our kids, and we are causing more harm to them by not disciplining them than by disciplining them. There's a couple more Proverbs that I'd like to share. Proverbs 23, verse 13 and 14. Proverbs 23, 13 and 14. He says, Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you punish him with the rod, he will not die. Punish him with the rod and save his soul from death. And then in Proverbs 29, verse 15. Proverbs 29, verse 15 says, a rod of correction imparts wisdom, but a child left to himself or a child undisciplined disgraces his mother. Not only does he disgrace his mother, but he disgraces his father. He disgraces God. And so we need to discipline our children. It is necessary to discipline our children. And when it's appropriate to punish a child, the child quickly and clearly knows what they've done wrong. When we sin and we're disciplined by God, it's because He taught us what to do, but we have willfully chose not to do it. And James, in James chapter 4, verse 17, James 4, verse 17 says, Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. And so we see that discipline is correction, which is focused on teaching why something is wrong. You see, it's not enough for someone to say something is wrong and then just say something like, uh, because I'm the dad and I said so. I don't know how many times I heard that before. And I probably said it a few times myself. But everyone needs to understand why they are doing something or why they're not doing something. You see, the why is the question of purpose and understanding of a thing. It's the compass that directs your decision, that guides your decisions. And once we understand and we see the purpose behind something, it's easier for us then to do it. And until you know why you do something, how can you know what you're doing? Well, discipline as correction establishes the rule of God and it shapes a person to submit their will to the Lord. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, it says, 
all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So that the man of God, or the woman of God, or the child of God, or the person of God, or the servant of God, however you want to interpret that, but the person may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so this is why the Word of God is to be the foundation of our discipline. It is the disciplinary manual for the Christian. This is how we are to discipline our children. And when used correctly, it it creates a reverent fear of God and a respect for parents that produces wisdom and understanding so that the child behaves well. Well, discipline leads to a real experience of the life of God in a person that is controlled by the Holy Spirit. And it breathes wisdom to help them to remain resolved on doing what is right, no matter what occurs in their life. Well, fathers, we have been commanded to provide instruction for our children. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, Ephesians 6, verse 4, he says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, the King James Version says, to provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And so we see that the purpose of parental discipline is to help children grow, not to exasperate or provoke them to anger and discouragement. You know, that's what my dad did to me for many years. And I dislike even saying it, but I hated my father. It wasn't until about four or five years before he died that he had asked me to forgive him for not being a good father and for not showing me the love that he should have. And I forgave him. And we reconciled our relationship. But let me encourage you, fathers. Don't allow ungodly discipline to destroy your relationship with your children. It almost destroyed my father and I's relationship. And thankfully, the Lord gave us enough time to mend that relationship. See, parenting isn't easy. It it requires a lot of patience to raise uh, children in a loving, Christ-honoring manner. But frustration and anger should not be causes of discipline. Instead, parents should act in love, treating their children just as Jesus treats people that He loves. See, this is vital to the child's development and understanding of what Christ is like. So I encourage you to correct them by teaching appropriate behavior. Encourage them as they are behaving appropriately. Develop a good relationship with your children so that they can be taught by influence and create a hunger for knowledge and understanding and wisdom and righteousness, doing what is right. Now, of course, in order to be a godly father or a godly parent, you must have a relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And if you're ready to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, will you place your faith and trust in Him, repenting of your sins, confessing Jesus to be your Savior and Lord and be baptized as He commanded for the forgiveness of your sins and to receive the indwelling gift of the presence 
of the Holy Spirit who will help you to be a better Christian and a better parent through teaching, discipline, and love as you faithfully obey His Word daily. If you're ready to make that decision, will you make it today? If you made that decision today, God bless you. I'd like to ask if you will use the information at the end of this video to get in contact with me. I would love to be able to talk with you and be able to help you to follow up on your decision from today. There is nothing better than being a parent, a being a father who loves his children and who disciplines them through godly discipline as found in God's word. I encourage you fathers today to be in God's word, to be in a relationship with God and allow him to discipline you when you sin to experience his love so that you in turn can show your love as you discipline your children. Have a great week and God bless.